speaker of the day is Triano Kalempi. So if you can all put a big hand together for her, thank you. shows how my stereotypical view of student life is being um, overturned uh, today. And because I think it was um, somewhat hard, it seems like it's somewhat harder for me to get here than for, uh, for many of you. Um, I'm, um, I'm um, really pleased to be here, um, and I'm really pleased to see so many people here to discuss such a really important topic. Um, but I, want, I wanted to start by um, by telling you a story. So I'm, so I'm the MP for Newcastle Central, and I grew up in a place called North Kenton. Do you know where North Kenton is? It's a council estate about two or three miles away. I'm very proud of coming from North Kenton. I'm very proud of being a Kenton girl. I call myself an old Kentonian, because I went to Kenton School, which didn't have all the facilities of Eton, but was a damn sight better school in my view. Um, and um, I, as MP, I organise conf- I organise sort of l- l- summits, seminars in each of the wards. Newcastle is made up of eight wards. Each of my wards, so that when I go to Parliament and speak for the people of Newcastle, I can talk about local issues. Because each of the wards in Newcastle is different. We have some of the richest wards in the country, I mean, Gosforth, and we have some of the poorest uh, wards in the country as well. Newcastle is a very diverse constituency. We have different ethnic groups. We have different communities. So I organized a ward summit in Kenton um, about a month ago. And uh, we invited the churches, the local religious groups, the police, housing, school heads, you know, all community leaders. And we talked about what the issues were facing people in Kenton Ward, what the most important issue was. and. Um, You can probably guess what the shared theme between all the public authorities there, all the community leaders, the shared theme that came out, which surprised me, uh, was mental health. And particularly mental health amongst young people. And how that was shaping the uh, local um, performance in schools, but also how it was shaping people's lives, antisocial behavior, uh, depression, hopelessness, um, the in, in, GP surgeries being enable to, um, to, to f- find the appropriate treatment for the people who were actually turning up at the surgeries to say what their problems were. Many more problems and issues which the police were dealing with, for example, which were actually had their root in mental, in mental health issues and there was no in community support for that. And what that made me realize, you know, as someone who thinks that I know my, you know, the place where I grew up really well, is that um, there has been, if there has been a tremendous evolution, you know, both in that understanding of mental health, but also in the support for it. Because I think what, uh, what we were talking about there with the, with the housing specialists, the police, the school teachers, etc., was that these, there were so many, there are many different types of mental health issues, but there was a lack of support for all of them, right? And that that was really shaping the lives and the outcomes of the community in which I grew up. And uh, that had a very um, you know, marked effect on me. So I, I would say that I, ever since I was elected in 2010, you know, I have been very aware of and campaigning on mental health issues. It was one of the, it was one of the, when I went to Parliament, it was one of the issues which I wanted to make uh, one of my priorities. And so, for example, I uh, led the campaign in Parliament to save the um, Richardson Eating Disorder Service here in Newcastle in the RVI just 
across the road, whichever way the road is, um, which was going to close, which, which was going to close, meaning that those with eating disorders from the northeast were going to be we were going to be being sent to the south of England, where they'd be totally without any family or friends support. And we were successful in, in, in support in saving that. Um, and we've also been very active in supporting local initiatives such as Rococo. Has anyone here heard of Rococo? So, yes, yeah, it's a great, um, it's a center for all different kinds of community organizations supporting mental health and well-being. And it's currently um, looking for a new uh, building, a new center. So it needs our support to help it find something. I've, been, I've made meeting with our NHS Mental Health Trust a, pri a priority and um, holding the government to account for the imposed top-down reorganization of national health services without supporting and still not supporting mental health has been one of my priorities. But I think even so, the, the levels and the, the sort of the, the depths and the complexity of the mental health crisis that we are facing uh, is something that can still be brought home to me by examples like that. So it, I think you know, just I'm sure you're, you're aware you know, common mental health disorders are increasing every year, but at the same time, 40% of NHS mental health services are men, are cutting their mental health services, and 800 million dollars pledged by the government to mental health services is actually because it's, it's been pledged. This is a trick they pay. They say they've given 800 million pounds for mental health services, but they haven't ring fenced the money. So it means it's being used to cut, it's being used to address all the other issues within the NHS, and I really think that rather than being, you know, the government have said that they want to establish or that they have already established parity of esteem for mental health services, whereas I think it could be more accurately described as parity of contempt. Uh, um, so I, I'll, what I'm just going to do, I'm going to talk for about another 10 minutes or so. I'm going to talk a little bit about the politics. I'm a politician, you know, so funny enough that. But I just wanted to start by talking about some of the actual, the figures and the reality of, the, of, of, what, of what we're facing here. So in 2016, one in five British people reported experiencing symptoms of depression or anxiety up from one in 10 in 2007. And in the past 25 years, rates of depression and anxiety, reported rates have increased by 70%. Um, now that's no doubt due to improved reporting and diagnosis, but that's unlikely to be the whole story. And as with, um, you know, at the same time, we still have such a level of stigma Given those figures, you would think that people, society would be more understanding of the prevalence of mental health, um, of mental health illness, but we still have a huge level of stigma associated with it. And we also have, I mean, the, the kind of attempts to blame mental health illness, mental health issues on social media and technology. And as an engineer myself, you know, I recognize the importance of technology and I certainly am you know, also campaigning to hold companies like Facebook and Twitter to, to account for the atmosphere of hatred that you can, that you find. And so as a, as a, you know, as a female politician, some of the things I get on Twitter um, certainly promote uh, bullying and hatred. But I don't, I also don't think that that is, it's appropriate to blame our issues, the impact of mental health, our lack of good mental health um, on social media entirely. Studies have shown that it has, an, it has had an impact, but it also shows that basic, um, if you like, cultural gaps that we have, cultural failings around loneliness, body image, which are most, um, which are driving, um, so, which are driving mental health issues at the same time, and so whilst I think there are links between social media, and I'll be interested in what you think, and increased rates of anxiety, depression, and, and poor sleep, that is not the whole story. Um, so 
the, the, the reason 19,000 teenagers are admitted to hospital for self-harm each year and a quarter of a million teens are in contact with mental health services is not just because of social media no neither is it because neither is it because of some kind of change in the nature of um, humanity I think we have the criticism if you like that you see of today's teenagers as being uh, the snowflake generation is really the um, sort of the the sort of failing around of those who do not have an understanding of the way in which mental health and physical well-being are truly equally important and are equally driven uh, by our uh, environment. And here in the Northeast, we suffer from higher rates of mental illness uh, than anywhere else. We have chronic underfunding. We also suffer from the highest rates of, um, of um, medical prescribing of drugs for mental illness. Um, we have a chronic underfunding mixed with a poor understanding of what the real issue is. We have the highest rates of people who have suffered from mental illness at 71%, as well as having the largest amount of people currently affected by mental health problems. And we have the highest rate in the UK of people taking their own life. And again, just one of the reasons why I feel so strongly or, or, or about this issue is just a few months after I became an MP, um, I, was a, uh, I was told the story of a local man who was on the Tyne Bridge um, threatening to throw himself off. He was uh, talked sort of away from that by a friend. He went to um, the RVR. He had to wait four hours to be seen, and then there was nobody available to give him any treatment, and there was no treatment that was going to be available for him for six months and his family and friends basically had to pay for him to have private treatment. Now, fortunately, they could afford that, but not everybody can. It's absolutely unacceptable that that kind of emergency mental health issue, if you broke, you know, if you broke your back or something, you would get immediate support and immediate treatment. And yet, when you have an emergency mental health issue, there is still not effective um, I would say effective emergency mental health support, which is why the police and other uh, public services find themselves supporting what a mental health service should really be doing. Um, and, and another important aspect of the mental health crisis is the, how it disproportionately affects minority groups. So people from black and minority ethnic groups are more likely to be diagnosed with mental health problems and are more likely to experience a poor outcome from treatments once we receive it. Now we've seen just, you know, the Windrush -ish generation scandal is, through, is all over the press. It's great that they have uh, woken up to it, if you like, after 50 years. Um, but um, that, you know, so, so that does highlight some potentially some of the reasons why for disproportionate experience of uh, mental illness because I know again as an MP going through the immigration and visa system in this country is enough to bring on mental health issues in anyone and I see it all the time. Equally in the LGBT community over half of young people report self-harm over twice the figure for heterosexual non-trans young people and 45% report considering suicide in the past year. One third, a third of trans people in the UK of all ages have attempted to take their lives on more than one occasion. Okay, so those are, I mean, I, mean, I could go on forever. You know, this, the, the challenges, the, you know, the failings of our mental health system are so numerous, if you like. You know, and I've spoken, you know, I think in Newcastle, we, we are doing a, trying to do a lot to raise awareness of that and to take away the stigma and conferences like this are really um, important. But what are sort of what other solutions should we be looking at? Um, I think political change is really important. And of course, I mean, I'm the Labour MP, but I'm a Labour MP for a reason. And that is because I believe that the Labour Party and the Labour government will take mental health seriously and more importantly invest the money where the rhetoric currently is 
So we've promised to ring fence mental health funding, make sure that every person in the country has access to high quality, well-funded mental health services um, as a right. Um, and we recognize that mental health requires a holistic approach, um, recognizing the huge range of factors and reversing the decline in chronic underfunding of public services. Um, so Labour's promise to provide the support and care that many people today feel they lack, to make sure that everyone has access to facilities in their local area, not having to travel mi miles for appointments, and to make the UK the healthiest country in the world for children, fighting health inequalities in tracking the link between ill health, physical and mental, and poverty. So, you know, we recognize I recognize that mental health is a unique challenge. Um, that it's, it is, I think, one of the challenges of this, of this age. Care, proper care for everyone in our society, in our community, is the great challenge, like the great social justice um, challenge of this age. And we need dedicated and well-funded services available to every person in every country, every community in this country. You know, Waiting six months for, for care is, for me, it's the same as not having care. Because particularly when it comes to mental health, you need to have the support there and then. So we also recognize that the housing crisis, the, you know, the, the, um, the crisis in our public services are contributing towards uh, men mental health health issues and we will be, we've committed to ensuring proper housing, to really in fact redressing the, our public services so that the support can be there and the diagnosis can be there for all, everyone who has mental, mental health issues. And, and finally, I think, you know, as part of this conference like today, but more generally, and this is, you know, talking about mental health and making normalizing talking about mental health and that's something that i think the campaign for mind also the campaigns from um prince william and uh, prince harry um the you know talk and many of my colleagues in parliament who are campaigning and speaking and talking about this all the time but it's not something that we should that we could think we have a battle the battle is won. We still see too much, far too much stigma attached to mental health illnesses. We still see employers not supporting people with mental health issues when they would support people with physical health issues. We still see mental health affecting disproportionately minorities and those facing particular challenges in their lives. And I really think that, you know, it is time to recognize this as one of the great challenges of our, you know, particularly your generation, and uh, make sure we do not go another generation um, of um, failure for those with mental health issues. Thank you very much. So, um, I think if, if I'm actually, I'm going off um, knocking on doors, which is a really interesting experience. I recommend it to anyone who wants to understand their fellow citizens better. But um, so I've, got, I've got a few minutes for questions, though, um, if there's anybody, if anybody has any questions or, you know, comments to, to make that they'd like me to take on board. So, can you say, can you say who you are when you ask? Sorry? Okay. Oh yes, he said today. He said that. Uh, yeah. Yes. No. No, I don't. When you say recently, do you mean in the last few weeks? So. Um, so, what I'm saying is that 
conduct between politicians on or offline about particularly, I mean, Dan's had to, had to put up with abuse, I've known her for 40 years, she's had to put it up, not just online uh, or in Parliament, but also from, from various groups. In the Houses of Parliament and in political discourse, politicians rip into each other constantly, demean each other, ridicule each other. They don't set a good example for public conduct or respect. Not all of them are disrespectful or hurtful or humiliating, but do you have any comments about the way, uh, 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 as exemplars of public behavior? Okay, um, well, um, yes. I, I, I take, firstly, you know, not all politicians are the same. <laughs> and I don't think, you know, so, so to say that all, poli or to imply that all politicians rip into, I, I, I certainly do not rip into my colleagues. Um, on, um, and I think that I think that as a standard, one should always um, debate the policy and not the personality. Um, clear, clearly, and unfortunately, that is not the case. And anyone who has uh, watched Prime Minister's questions, you know, will see that that Prime Minister's questions is sort of deliberately set up to be a sort of bear baiting kind of or dog fight almost. Uh, which does, and as the speaker, um, John Burko regularly says, does not promote either effective uh, discourse or debate, or, I agree totally, um, good mental health. And it is not an example of how um, debate should take place. It is not at all an example of how debate should take place. And it does tend to depend, I mean, on, on humiliate, attempting to humiliate or undermine the, the um, politicians in question. I mean, and, and Diane has, you know, Diane has had, Diane is the most, um, basically the most, certainly on social media, at least the most vilified politician. Um, you know, and she has withstood an a huge and unbelievable amount of abuse, which I think is finally being taken seriously, but for many years has not been taken seriously because it was, it was thought, one of the reasons was it was thought that politicians um, should be should be able to, in fact I've said this said to me, should be able to, um, should grow a pair and be able to put up with uh, whatever tax they receive, which is why, so, which is why I think, you know, politicians, the point of parliament is to represent people, so politicians should, not, should neither be expected to be more thick-skinned or to be more aggressive than uh, we want as part of our society generally. But yeah, so I do think politicians need to be good examples, as we need to be good examples of everything. We need to be better examples. And there are some politicians who are, I think, who are particularly um, sort of virulent. But I would say that that reflects wider in a culture which, which tends to value more um, aggressive, what are considered, what have been considered to be traditionally masculine uh, attributes uh, and in men and value them less in women and value more consensual uh, informed debate less and I think we need to be changing um, we need to be changing society throughout society um, in that I also think you know this is my um, you know I've said you know shows like show media shows which set out to humiliate people which have very much a, a winner takes all and a loser gets trampled underfoot approach. And I won't name them because I don't think they want to give them any more publicity, but there are them. Those are also not good. Those are also undermining a constructive approach to debate and discussion and to success, which we should have. Thank you. And if anyone has any suggestions about what we can do about this, then please email me. <laughs> or John Burko. He's, he's very keen to change parliament. Um, I, so just to finish on that, I think when Parliament is 50% women, then we will see, we've already seen change, we'll see more change. I'm not saying it'll be perfect, but it'll be better. Hi there. Um, my name's Fiona. Um, Hi, Fiona. Uh, this is more something I'd really just like to raise because it wasn't really touched upon, although you did reference mental health services. Um, but I'd be fascinated to hear your comments on it. Um, 
there's been a lot of scandal in the last few years over the treatment of physically disabled people during disability assessments. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. what's not necessarily been noticed as much is the mistreatment of people with debilitating mental illnesses to the point where actually it's quite a common thing in disability assessments. I actually know two people who have, who have had this asked. Um, essentially, if you're so mentally ill, why haven't you committed suicide yet? Uh, that's considered to be an appropriate thing to say. And I was just wondering about your, you know, what your view on disability assessment currently was, especially with reference to mental health. Yeah, no, you're right. I should have mentioned that. But, well, but it's, so it's, I mean, I, so um, if you follow, if you, those of you who have followed this, which I have to say is so dispiriting and disheartening because the, you know, the, what mentally, what, what mentally unwell people face in the disability assessments is worse, I would say, generally than what the physically un unwell face. But what the physically unwell face is 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 is, all, is unbelievably humiliating, frustrating, repetitive. You know, so, so both having to prove, you know, every every year that you are really, 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 really unwell, as you were really, really, really unwell a year ago. And so um, Esther McVeigh recent was it recently about a couple of months ago had to come to Parliament to admit that basically they'd got it wrong. They'd been taken, um, the government was taken to court um, by, um, um, some, by those with um, mental illnesses to, uh, to, to say that they were not being uh, treated fairly, and they weren't. And uh, the, the particular point I raised in that uh, exchange with Esther McVeigh, just to say that uh, showing respect to Esther McVeigh is, is one of the challenges which I feel that I, I rose to at that occasion because I was not unduly rude. Um, but um, so, so for, particularly, for example, so I have, um, I have constituents who, as a consequence of, of, of sexual uh, abuse, um, have, you know, long-term documented, you know, mental health issues. You know, and yet they are being required, or they were going to be required to relive that and talk through that, you know, every year as part of their uh, PIP assessment. And so, um, and so we're still waiting to, to see what, or still waiting, I think we're still waiting to find out exactly how they are going to change, to look to change the process to at least comply with the court requirements. But you're, you know, you're right, and, you know, and I, and you have, um, Particularly those with you know, people with um, multi, I would say with multiple illnesses, and you know, if you take it holistically, that is often the case. Um, it is um, it, it shows that the sort of the parity of esteem um, claim is uh, abso as absolutely not justified. Can you Hello, uh, my name's Matty Lacey, um, proud member of the Labour Party yes. from, from North, <laughs> North Tyneside, but from within Newcastle. Um, it's just to follow up about the point around um, tackling mental health issues early, and I'm just wondering in terms of policy, how would you feel about um, introducing um, compulsory mental health education within schools and, you know, from a very early age, so it opens up that platform to talk about it again holistically and for, uh, you know, in line with these academic subjects, so we'll get a, a more understanding around everyone's issues, and this is to do with LGBT rights and various mm, other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, so I think it's, abs I think, you know, it's, abs it is essential, it's absolutely essential that, um, that we talk about mental health issues for an early age, and the reason you get, and sorry, you know, again, the reason you get, the reason you have, and it is particularly, just to say this, older men have real, diff you know, statistically real difficulty going to their GP with mental health issues and talking about mental health. And the reason for that is obviously, you know, because it is not normalized in childhood and youth that one talks about one's mental health and one's mental, one's mental state and that what, that, so I think, you know, I think I think best practice in schools, you know, you know so I'm, it's just something we're looking at. We we'll, we'll looked at if you like to place further requirements on um, school curricula, 
you know, we are fighting, 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 fighting to get sex education <laughs> um, part of uh, compulsory. And I think that's a, a ten-year fight it's been, certainly been as long as this government's been. Uh, been about. Um, but um, maybe that's maybe that's something that could be, you know, part of it. But cause I think you're right. I think that should be, it should certainly be the be best practice in schools that we talk about um, mental health and, and you know and well-being because um, what you know what everyone agrees on what is clear is that not talking about it is far worse than talking about it and it contributes to the stigma it also contributes to you know mental health increasing mental health costs because with latent diagnosis etc so um, so yeah I think that's something that we should we should consider and um, I will come back to you as to where when we are formulating policy on that. Hello, I'm Jamie. Also Hi. a Labour member. I don't want to be outdone. Um, <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes! Where are you a Labour member? Um, my constituency is like, well, like Jasmine. Like, right. yeah. um, so I've forgotten his name. Nick Brown. That's it, yeah. yeah. Um, Anyway, um, thank you for your speech, by the way. It's actually really therapeutic to be reminded that a lot of our issues come from like the, the material base of society and not our own personal failings a lot of the time. <laughs> yes. um, but to, to my question, it kind of relates to the, the discussion about social media and Diane Abbott and you and the abuse you've received, etc. cetera. Um, and this doesn't have to relate to like, Parliament especially, although it can. Um, but just like being kind of like anyone who is in the public eye or kind of um, works kind of as a public servant, etc. Because a lot of us here will probably be interested in activism and things like that. Yes, it's a good point. I yeah. kind of wondered, you know, if, if you've seen kind of like mental health issues kind of around that sphere and like how you think kind of working under that level of public scrutiny kind of relates to one's mental health and how it affects it. Okay, that's a really uh, that's a really interesting that's a very interesting question, you know. And um, you know, there's so I, see, I, yeah, I think um, I think I think activism and um, you know uh, having grown up in a very uh, poor and underprivileged community um, in the, you know as a as a a um, member of. Um, um, a minority and as, as, a, as a woman which is not a minority but is a minority in terms of power um, activism and standing up for what you believe in is very empowering and that is positive so that so I suppose I'm, I'm starting off with the positive so I so it's something that I would recommend really would recommend to everyone because standing I think standing up for what you believe in is empowering by definition um, now you know it's it is true also that in our flawed society, what comes with that can be very um, undermining. It can certainly feel undermining at the time, whether that is abuse on social media or it is, you know, people uh, questioning your motives or it is, uh, you know, um, what some some consider robust debate but which can be you know to the earlier question very um hostile you know so that can that can certainly be undermining but what i would say about that and i'm speaking personally here is being part of a group or you know a network whether you know, it's the labor party it's also the feminist movement um it's also um like the um you know, I was a member of anti-apartheid movement. Being part of a group, that's where you can. It's a, it, 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 it kind of, um, you know, it's like a sort of a. It's, it, it can you can give you strength, and you can also exchange um, experiences, and you can realize, you know, help you realize that it is not. Um, yeah, it's not normal to be abused for your views, and I think that is really, really important. So. You know, I don't think, as, as I said, uh, you know, earlier, I don't think one should have to have any greater sort of level of insensitivity, you know, to have thick skin to be able to be um, active in politics or whatever kind or whatever social movement you're interested in. But what it, it is important to have support networks 
like in, every, in everything. So um, yeah, I, there was a period last year, about a year ago, when I was the most um, abused person on Twitter. Um, I, I think I, I beat Diane Abbott for just for a couple of weeks uh, following, <laughs> uh, following a comment I made um, um, about Prince Philip. And um, I think having so having the support of people around is is really important. But you should I, I would really hope I would really I think if what I um I don't know who who follows J.K. Rowling, um you may have noticed on Twitter you may have noticed that she 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 um you know, said that she would she tweeted I think it was last week that she was sick of the advice of don't feed the trolls because that leaves the space on social media for the trolls. And I think if you don't, if you don't, you know, stand up for your views, take part in social movements, join the Labour Party, be active, because of concerns about um, the response that will um, engender, then uh, it leaves the sort of the public space to the idiots, basically, you know, and that just makes things worse for everyone. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's an interesting take. Thanks. Um, Any other questions? To be fair, I have another question. Sorry? Um, <laughs> if, Sorry? No else, if no one else wants it, I can ask you something <laughs> quick. Um, yeah, it's just like, um, um, what do you think about like kind of um, political education and like mental health? And like, do you think that the two can be kind of related in an interesting way? Because I'm, I'm doing this, um, I'm doing this project with this charity called Changing Lives. So I oh yeah, I know Changing. I was, yeah, I was going to email you about it at some point, actually. I wanted your take on it. But the idea is, like, um, you know, a lot of the people there have, like, really quite severe mental health issues, but this also combines with um, being very kind of dislocated from society and not really having support networks or a lot of the time a good education. Like, um, mm -hmm. I met one guy who um, was literate because he'd just been in and out of prison his entire life. Um, so I was kind of thinking, like, you know, what if you tried to, as you say, kind of empower these people by um, kind of forming kind of like activist groups out of out of um, out of them, and then trying to make and trying to you know guide them towards um, helping them kind of do activism around the issues they face. I don't know. I, I wondered if maybe if you had time, you'd be interested in. Um, I don't know, having, having a, a talk to them at some point if this project ever gets off the ground. Oh, well, I mean, so, you know, so Changing Lives is based in, um, in or part of it is based in Newcastle. In fact, I'm meeting, I think I'm meeting the, I met the chief executive a month or so ago, and I'm meeting, so I meet, I meet with them quite regularly. And if you look at, a, if you're having a project which is around people in my constituency that I'm always interested in, in anything that involves the well-being of my constituents and um, you know, particularly those who are disenfranchised and disempowered. You know, I think political, I mean, I think political or social activism for the, is most effective when those who are um, affected by the issues are being active around it. So if it is, uh, that, that applies to mental health, it applies to, um, you know, if it's, if it's um, immigration or migration, um, it, applies to, it applies to poverty. So um, I think that's what, that's what social, org you know, that's what, if you remember in the, um, the I think it was the first, uh, when Barack Obama was um, elected and he said he'd been a social um, organizer, a community organizer in Chicago and um, the Republicans attacked him and said, What's ex you know, what, what kind of job is that? And then he came back with, you know, Christ was a community organizer. <laughs> and um, as many of the Republicans, or evangelical Christians, uh, that shut them up. Um, and, you know, so I think community organization, you know, to, the, to, to, make, so to, to help communities um, address uh, the disempowering issues that they face is, is important and can be really effective. But I do think it also has to be done carefully, so it's not manipulating people, but it is helping people find their own voice and helping people stand up for themselves. Absolutely. And I think, yeah, I think politics and 
you know, I think politics and mental health are are intertwined. And um, my understanding is that the rates of mental health issues in politicians are, as far as it can be told, addressed are higher than in society. Um, the studies indicate are higher than in societies. And I think you do need to be, um, it does need to be emphasized, you know, I think politics is about changing the world for the better, and mental health is obviously a huge part of that. Hello again. Uh, <laughs> yet again. Um, in terms of the university's role in um, outreach of education oh, right. in the kind of more disadvantaged groups in the city, um, do you agree that much more needs to be done so we don't kind of turn it into this, you know, um, echo chamber bubble of a quite privileged set of, you know, people who've got to this stage and recognise that privilege and how do you think this gap can be, you know, preached so, not preached, uh, breached, breached so... Yeah. You know, it is for the whole of Newcastle and not just the students. So. I think that's a, that's a fantastic question. I always and I say this to the I sort of said this to the previous. Um, is it, it's vice chancellor, isn't it? I'm I'm not very good with university hierarchy, but I said this to the previous vice chancellor and the, you know the current one, Chris Day, that growing up as a working class kid from the north of Newcastle, the university was a block of real estate absolutely nothing to do with my life as far as I could figure out, you know, and um, and certainly, um, you know, both the previous Vice-Chancellor um, and Chris Day, the current Vice-Chancellor, what, one of the things I really admire about them is that they have made it, or they've set, you know, put to change that by making Newcastle University a civic university and the slogan, um, excellence with purpose, you know, is to reflect that, that it's, you know, that excellence on itself, in itself, you know, is excellent, um, it's not so useful, um, but with purpose um, and, you know, being part of the community in which it finds, in which Newcastle has the good fortune to find itself. So I think, you're, I think, it's, I think it's a fantastic question. I think Newcastle um, is certainly, talk, Newcastle University is certainly talking a lot of the good talk about change of that, and I've been involved in outreach, and I think I'm coming back to the university when we're having uh, kids in from local schools to um, to look at um, to to engage better, um, but I still think there's lots more that can be doing, particularly by the student body. And I want you know I would love to see. And I know that you know I've, I've spoken to student groups who are um, engaging with communities. Um, I know, for example, I know that um, levels of dental care in the northeast of Newcastle are far below that in the south because we don't have as many dentists and also as many dentists in the community. So the dental school here, I am told, is uh, sending out trainee uh, students into community dental practices. Yeah. And I would like to see much, whatever, whether it's dentistry or if it's English literature or whatever you're studying, you know, communities should be able to benefit from that as well. And I would like to see much more of that. And, you know, any suggestions about that, let me know. Somebody, just somebody, a lady, a woman at the last row. Hiya, I'm Abby, um, and my question was, when you talked about um, how um, kind of the Labour Party want to make it so that everyone in the country has access to good quality mental health services, and I think that's a really like admirable aim um, and I work in an NHS service myself um, so this is like an important issue for me but what I'm asking is kind of do you think that's actually realistic that that might actually happen and how would like you go about um, starting to make changes to improve the situation? Okay. Well, that's a great question you know the practical question how is that going to happen and uh, you know as an engineer Myself, I always like to know how things are going uh, to happen, and, but it is it is particularly challenging because because you know, as I try to touch upon, mental health is entwined with so many other aspects of our society, and so you know I mean the first thing if you so the first thing is like is is to try is to start bridging the gap in investment um, because again you know this 800 million that the government talks about is being used to plug all the other areas of underfunding 
So we have said, um, this was in the last election, it was, uh, was 30 billion over five years to address the underfunding in our NHS services. Um, so that, um, and in terms of how we pay for that, what we set out in our manifesto for the 2017 election was um, changes we would make to the tax and benefit system to generate that 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 money, and um, the main one was um, was to reverse the Tories' policy of cutting corporation tax every year. So even though it was the lowest in Europe, you know, to cut, one of the lowest in Europe, cutting it every year to get it from 27 percent, I think, to 17 percent. We said we'll stop where we are. You know, we won't put it up. We won't cut it any further. And part of that money would be used to fund uh, the NHS. And we also um, were looking at. Um, um, raising the taxes on this, what, uh, by one percent on those paying over f over um, no, on those paying over one hundred fifty thousand a year. So there were particular measures set out, you know, to raise the funding, the, the financial funding, pretty clearly. That as Sh I'm the shadow minister for industrial strategy, you know, if we have if we don't have an economy, the the, the thing with the austerity economics meant that you know the economy wasn't growing because th there was no investment, there was no decent public transport, there was no decent health service. So we've also said we'll invest in public transport, we'll be investing in the economy so that we get a growing economy. You know, when people people haven't had a pay rise in the Northeast on average since 2010. When people don't have pay rises, they're not paying more taxes, so there's not more income. So that's one of that. So that's in terms of the income, that's how it is. But it is also organisationally, you know, because you need to be able to um, to identify and refer people uh, with, with red cell, as well as having the the the, the, the integrated um, health service, which means that you know, mental health challenges or mental health issues are identified as part of the health uh, part of the normal primary and secondary care, and that's sort of challenging as well. And that's what um, what um, you know we are looking at uh, together with um, integrating social care as well, uh, so that um, it can be you know, from birth to death, a wraparound health and social care service. So I think, I think, you know, I think, on, I think on the investment, we've told the story in terms of the sort of the, the organizationally, how that, how that happens, you know, recruiting more mental health nurses and staff and integrating the, 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 social, the social care and mental health into the service, but um, but we haven't got you know we haven't got the detailed all the detailed plans that. And if you have suggestions, um, please let me know. Okay, thank you very much. I'll just be very quick. Um, um, despite the fact uh, that the Newcastle University Wellbeing Services recently employed more mental health professionals and therapists, um, to be honest, they're still not up to the standards that they need to be. Right. Um, and this is in regard to someone who's very close to me who's had an extremely negative experience of the wellbeing service at Newcastle Uni right. University specifically. And um, they've also been, uh, approached several different um, facilities and supports in Newcastle and oh, right. have been somewhat turned away by some of them, which is absolutely right. disgraceful um, because they're not very well at all. They need urgent help and they're not getting it. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, would you be able to put pressure on Newcastle University and Northumbria University services, mental health services, to ensure that these people are getting more immediate support because she's it's resorting to this person being uh, having to drop out of university because they're not well enough. That's a really good point. And, sorry, and I should, I mean, so there's so much to talk about with mental health. I'm just thinking about the things I didn't talk about and I should have talked about more. Would, would you know, like the, when I talk about the Rococo um, uh, um, organization, that's because it's a, it's community based and it doesn't turn people away. People can come in for, you know, and find different, different ways of having support. And that has to be part of the, if you like, the, the, the not the solution, but the, landscape for an effective mental health service is to have different community-based organizations which can identify and help um, those with mental health issues. Now if this um, is, if I'm, I am, I'm always very happy to take up issues for my constituents, 
Is this is this is your friend a constituent of mine? What what do you mean? What do they live here? Where do they live? Where do they? No, live? they live with me in in Newcastle. In Newcastle, sent in. Heaton. Okay, so that so the constituent of Newcastle of um, Newcastle um, East, which is Nick Brown. Right. Um, but so, but if you if you write to your MP, mm -hmm. then I'm sure Nick will be very happy to t will be happy to take it up. If you know anyone who is in my constituency, which is Newcastle Central, I'm very happy, very very happy, more than happy indeed, uh, to write to the university and ask what they're doing for mental health well-being uh, for students. Because I think you're absolutely right. It's um, it's really important to have um, community instead of asking people to come to where like the services, the service needs to go to where the people are. Exactly. Thank you. Right, I'm afraid I have to, I have to go door knocking in Arthur's, in Arthur's ear. <laughs> um, but that's okay. Unless there's any other burning issues there. But hey, I'm, it's really great to have this conversation and debate, you know. And I, again, on 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning, I'm really impressed. And um, yeah, as I say, anyone who has, you know, anything that you feel that I should be raising, or should be more aware of. It's a huge issue. There's so much to be done. So um, please feel free to. Um, I'll leave. Um, I mean, I'm on. I'm on the web anyway. But um, just um, I'll leave one of these here, which has my, which has my contact details. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Nachi, for her time. We have a, a quick quarter of an hour break now for you to get some refreshments and move uh, towards the next thing that you'd like to do in the timetable. In here, there's a panel on the stage about BAME and faith in mental health and how that affects people. Bill Cunningham will be work, doing a workshop upstairs on psychosis, so a few of uh, the one that you might have seen yesterday. And in the lounge, us active, who did talk yesterday, are running a yoga workshop. So get some refreshments and move to what you'd like to have a look at next. Thank you, everyone.